So, firstly, I'd like to apologise that it's been a while since I've made a video. I have got quite a lot going on in life, as I'm sure many of you will understand, because that is truer for many of us, um, and that's reduced my time available to make videos. But, as and when I get the time, I will continue to produce more content, exposing more about what took place at Abu Dhabi 2021 which was a fraud. What we see going on in the world at the moment is a lot of things going on. And this shit show of Formula One keeps churning out content. And I say the word content because it is a drama show all the time. It's a drama show. And um, something that's taken place over the last few days that I've seen pop up on Facebook and on Instagram, I don't really use Instagram that much, but I see this has popped up on there. And um, it's irked me, so I'm going to just go into it. I try to not stray too far from Abu Dhabi 2021, but this is important and it's related. So here goes. And understand what I'm trying to say here. Virtue signaling, okay, which is what you see on screen. The public expression of opinions or sentiments intended to demonstrate one's good character or social conscience or the moral correctness of one's position on a particular issue. Virtue signalling. These people that, you know, put themselves out there to um, make out that they are concerned or that they're campaigning for a good cause. OK. Now. Some of you, no doubt, will want to jump up in the comments section and accuse me of that. Um, and it may have its merits. Yes, I've taken to YouTube to express my concern about an injustice. And ultimately, time will tell whether this is just virtue signalling or not. Is there any substance behind my words? Well, time will tell. No point in me trying to protest at this moment in time. Time will tell whether I'm just talking or whether I'm a person of action. However, with this notion of virtue signalling, what we're seeing at the moment um, is this guy, um, Sebastian Vettel. I can't even see uh, that, that one there. I don't know if you've seen this sort of thing appearing on uh, Instagram or on social media. Sebastian Vettel uh, raising the awareness about Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna died in 1994. I remember watching it. I was around about 16 years of age. Something like that. And I found it shocking. I vividly remember the commentators describing the situation at the time that Senna had been airlifted to hospital. Because again, this is something that was broadcast when you were watching the Grand Prix live. We were watching this unfold. And I remember it may have been Murray Walker, but I, I don't know exactly. But I remember this. They said that he was, his condition was described as being in a grave condition. Now, at that time, when anybody's condition was reported in the news, um, if, if somebody was, they might be classed as critical, it might have been stable. Um, they were the, the terms that we used to describe somebody's condition if they'd been involved in an incident okay i'd never heard that term grave relating to somebody's medical condition before that stayed with me ever since okay now why is it now that we are remembering senna okay is it because it's 30 years on from that so Sebastian Vettel has taken it upon himself. He's no longer an F1 driver. 
but he's taken it upon himself to now inform the world. Inform the new breed of fans of this. Oh, this, this guy from the olden days who died at a motor racing circuit. Now, don't get me wrong. I used to like Sebastian Vettel. I would have probably classed him as my favourite driver for a period of time. Now, my history of following Formula One dates back to the 80s, where Nigel Mansell was my favourite driver. Uh, when he moved over to IndyCar and um, I kind of then switched to following Damon Hill, although never really... Um, Never really liked Damon Hill particularly because I didn't particularly like his character. Nigel Mansell had this kind of bullish um, fighting character that you could see within his driving. Damon Hill, not so much. A bit of a flange really. So I was never really took to Damon Hill. I quite liked Johnny Herbert, although Johnny was never really um, world champion kind of level. But I liked him and I thought he was a decent driver. Uh, Brundle. I wouldn't say I disliked Brundle. I thought he was all right. Did well at um, the World Endurance Car Championship. I used to follow that when he used to race for the Jaguar team. And um, so I did like Brundle. But again, never really did anything when it came to Formula One. Didn't like Jensen Button. Thought he was a bit of a flange as well. But when Lewis Hamilton burst onto the scene, I thought he was great. Should have won that world championship in his first season. Um, I feel certain he would have done had I been his race engineer and had there not been any fixing going on in the sport. Who knows what was going on? People do, though. But from the outside of the sport, it's just speculating. But what I found with Lewis Hamilton is over the years, the impression I got was that he became a bit more Hollywood, a bit more interested in living a more Hollywood lifestyle and didn't appear to be focusing his full attention on the sport. Now, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. This might be just me falling for the media narrative who wanted to paint him like that. What I did notice was that from he, he changed the way he spoke he, he developed this more kind of americanized accent and um the way he, he kind of presented himself was just a bit more it was a bit more hollywood i think most people understand what i mean when i say that now why should i not like that well that's that's down to me i like what i like you know it, but that's irrelevant really isn't it it doesn't really matter it shouldn't matter to Lewis Hamilton whether people like the way he chooses to speak or like what he wears or how he wants to present himself. But, you know, ultimately, that was my opinion of him. But I was pleased that he was succeeding when he was winning. Um, I hoped that he would win when he didn't win. You know, I, I was hoping that he would. That's just the nature of it. That's that was the, the level of my support. But as a sport, I kind of drifted away from Formula One. It gets a bit tedious at times, gets a bit boring. Got back into it for the 2021 season. Saw things happening in that sport that I knew to be wrong. Saw a style of driving that I knew to be wrong. Started at Spain. 2021 when I saw somebody throwing his car at the other car and Lewis Hamilton having to dive out the way and I was then thinking at that moment in time well why is Lewis here why is he allowing this to happen why is he not teaching this other person a lesson why is he kind of like just jumping out of the way of him but as the season went on I realized the genius and he was a great driver but the way I saw him drive in 2021 made me actually analyse his sport a bit more and made me realise his craft. He was brilliant. And I'm not going to go into that on this video, but um, 
2021 cemented Lewis Hamilton as being an all-time great driver. Not that he wasn't before that, but in terms of how we can go about analysing things. 2021 cemented certain things. But this isn't about Lewis Hamilton. This is about Seb Vettel. The reason I liked Sebastian Vettel um, was that I just seemed to like his character. Okay, When I'd seen him on episodes of Top Gear, and when I'd seen him, the, the YouTube clips of him, at like award ceremonies and things like that, he just seemed to have quite a playful character, seemed to come across as a nice guy, and therefore... And, and this notion that he also um, stood with his fellow drivers that were campaigning and joined in them campaigns and was willing to speak up for injustices, I thought, you know, Sebastian Vettel seems like a good guy. Now, he wasn't the best of drivers, don't get me wrong. I don't really... I don't. I didn't follow the sport that much when he won his four titles, but four titles is what he's got. I followed it a little bit more when he was at Ferrari. Uh, I saw him make more mistakes than he should have done. Um, and no, he's not as good a driver as Lewis Hamilton, but I just seem to like his character. We we kind of gravitate to certain people because of character. Um, you know, that can make be the difference as to why we prefer certain individuals to others, because we just seem to like their character. Um, so that was the reason that I I would have probably had been had I been asked, say, who is your favourite Formula One driver? It would have probably said, yeah, whilst I respect Lewis Hamilton for being brilliant, I think I quite like Seb Vettel. That's how I felt. Now, the other thing that, obviously, Sebastian Vettel, he uh, raced in 2021. I think he raced in 2022. And then he's retired from the sport. Since retiring, he hasn't really said anything. I thought he would. I really thought he would. I thought the kind of character that he was, his willingness to stand up for injustice, I thought that once he retired from that sport, he would be willing to call out the corruption within that sport. And he hasn't. What he has done, okay, is this notion of buzzing corner at the Japanese Grand Prix. He wanted one of the curbs painted yellow and black. And he set up some beehives there to say, oh, we need to save the planet by me putting some beehives at a motor racing circuit where they're churning out pollutants which are attributed for causing climate change. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. It's really, really, uh, really well done there. Um, but now we're getting this one. We are getting this one from Seb about Senna. Now, if you really want to know about Senna, I suggest you watch this video. We're going to go through, not that video. That's one to watch if you, uh, watch this channel actually. S Binala 44 Go and check that channel out. You've probably already subscribed there because they've got five, six times as many subscribers as I've got. S Binala 44 Max Verstappen the Fraud. Have a look at that video. Well worth a watch. But the video that you want to watch if you are interested in finding out what happened at Imola 30 years ago is this one. Now, with anything, I will advise you, I will guide you to be sceptical of everything. When I say something, um, make sure you validate the information I give you. I do my best to provide you with accurate, truthful information. but. I've had to gain that information from somewhere. And if I've not got that information correct, then I'm passing on misinformation. So I'm hoping that what I can present you with is truthful and a factual account of what's really going on. What it is in terms of Abu Dhabi is an analysis of the information that has been given to us all by the sport of Formula One. And I'm categorically proving that to be lies. That, that that is it is indisputable 
okay? But have a look at this one about, um, I'm going to play you some of it through actually. Um, the crash that changed Formula One forever. And again, check out the channel, uh, daily fuel up. So this has had 728,000 views already, um, but well worth a watch. Again, hopefully it's accurate, but let's have a look. Two seconds. Yeah. Anyway. The blackest day in Grand Prix history. Those are the words Murray Walker used to describe the aftermath of perhaps the most tragic racing weekend ever witnessed in Formula One. On what had been a weekend full of hesitant, reluctant and careful driving, everyone knew things were not right, that something would go wrong. And they were proven right on lap seven. But perhaps in hindsight, more heartbreaking than the crash itself were the events that led up to it. So, this is something that um, if you watch the sport in the 80s and the 90s, this wasn't new. OK, now, those of you that have been watching it since when was it? 2020, was it? Uh, Roman Grosjean, his accident where his car effectively split in half and it ended up in a fireball and Grosjean ended up with burnt hands. Occasionally, we see these things in F1 now, but back in the 80s and 90s, it was even worse. They'll show you the picture of Martin Donnelly. I remember seeing that back in, in the either 80s or early 90s. You go back even further in this sport, the 60s and the 70s, it had been even worse. Now, that was before my time. But guys were risking their lives. In sport, you don't want to see people die. That's not sport. And if that's what you want to see, well... There's something fucking wrong with you. Um, so over the years, they have developed safety. OK, they've developed um, safety in terms of the cars, the circuit design, the provision for uh, the, the crash barriers and how they are able to absorb impact to better protect the driver. And what? is deemed acceptable within driving standards is something that has been developed to try to minimize the risk to drivers this is all known okay this these are things that this is this is how we evolve as a species now if we do not learn from our past if we do not learn from history what is going on now, on a slightly different note, I look at life in the United Kingdom in 2024. And I wonder where we've come in the last 30 years, because I think we've gone backwards in a lot of in a lot of areas. Especially with the technology that should have improved. There's areas of life where we've gone backwards. Now, why is that? Life for everybody's gone backwards. And yet, there's been billionaires created. What's going on there? Anyway, that's for a different video. Carry on with this one about the uh, 1994 Imola crash. But which one? On the bustling morning of Friday, April 29th, 1994, the air was charged with anticipation as Senna hopped into a helicopter at 8.30 a.m., whisking him away to the circuit for a day packed with practice and qualifying sessions. In the lead-up to the Imola race, the Williams team had been hard at work addressing the persistent issues with the Williams car. Between Persistent issues with the Williams car. Oh, um, who was the... Um... Who was the Williams designer at the time? Um, oh, um, 1994 Williams FW16. Um, oh, that was that was the genius. That was the genius. You know, it, it didn't win anything for um, eight years when Mercedes won the Constructors' Championship. Um, the genius. Didn't win anything for them eight years. But um, when Williams had the Renault engine, right, which was the most powerful engine, and they'd got stuff like active suspension and stuff like that going on, the genius produced um, championship winning cars. 
Mm. But but certainly in 2020, 2021, they didn't win the Drivers' Championship. 2022 and 2023, where the genius has produced um, this uh, rocket ship of an RB18 and RB19. We're focusing on the genius um, designing that car rather than the RBPT, Red Bull Powertrains, or Honda Red Bull Powertrains. Oh, I thought Honda had left the sport. Then, you know, that's why there was a freeze on engine development agreed by all the teams. Um, we're not focusing on what power output is um, that powertrain producing relative to the other cars. Because all the other time when we were watching Formula One, they were telling us about which was the powerful engine. I think the Mercedes was the most powerful engine during those McLaren years. And I think the Renault engine was the most powerful engine during those... Uh, for Sebastian Vettel championships. But when it comes to uh, 2022 and 2023, we don't know, do we? It's the genius of Adrian Newey that's the, the factor there, isn't it? But um, anyway, back to the, the Ayrton Senna situation. Between the races in Japan and Imola, they conducted rigorous tests at the Nogaro circuit in southwestern France, striving to pinpoint and rectify the car's performance woes. Promised modifications were on the horizon, but Senna maintained a level of skepticism about their effectiveness. Well, let me try and uh, fast forward the advert. Williams' car had been consistently lacking behind the Benetton, despite boasting a more potent engine. Oh, so they used to tell us back then, but they don't anymore since Red Bull, or since Honda left the sport, but then returned at the Japanese Grand Prix, where, um, oh, we've given the penalty to Charles Leclerc within five seconds of the race ending, and uh, that means Max Verstappen, uh, world champion. Wow, you couldn't make it up, could you? Uh, a Red Bull driver, or a Hon now a Honda-powered Red Bull driver, winning the Japanese Grand Prix and world championship. At the Japanese Grand Prix, the home of Honda. Incredible. You couldn't make it up, could you? But, yeah, no, nothing going on here. Nothing to see here. Nothing illegal about that engine. Nothing that that engine has been developed more than any other engine. Who had All the other teams had agreed some sort of power freeze or some development freeze. Honda didn't go away and, you know find some more power by developing it or Red Bull didn't do anything dodgy. No, no, it's the genius. Adrian Newey that's made the car, isn't it? But they used to um, give us a put. The genius had got an 830 horsepower engine in his car and it was um, the Benetton with only 740 um, was outperforming it. Although did the Benetton have traction control and other driver aids at the time because that was rumoured to be the case. We can't really trust this sport, can we? This so-called sport. Who knows? Who knows? See, I'm just a guy that watches and is fed information. Just like most of you are just people that watch and are fed information. We don't know the authenticity of that information. We don't have the first-hand data. We're reliant on people telling us. But if then people are lying, then we become misinformed. And what I will guarantee you is those people that are presenting that information at the moment about modern day Formula One are lying. They lied in 2021. They lied to you about the rules of the sport. And ever since, I have not been able to trust them. I do not believe a word that Sky Sports F1 say. Anyway, we'll carry on. Both Senna and his teammate Damon Hill had openly expressed their frustrations, labelling the car as challenging to handle. But despite the obvious difficulties, it was evident from the time disparities between Senna and Hill that Senna was skillfully navigating through the car's problems during practice. A newly designed car difficult to handle? Surely not, because he's a genius.
sessions. Hill would later humbly admit Ayrton had enormous reserves of ability and could overcome deficiencies in a chassis. The clock neared 9.30 am when Senna slid into his car and raced around the track. Completing an impressive 22 laps, he posted a fastest time of 1 minute and 21.598 seconds, outpacing his teammate by over a second. Hill was pleasantly surprised by the altered chassis' behavior, but Senna still harbored doubt, feeling that the team was steering the car in the wrong direction. He later spent considerable time in discussion with his engineer, David Brown, expressing his concerns. As the clock That's what good drivers do. Their technical knowledge of the car, how it feels, what needs to be done to get them the car that they want, that they need in order to perform. And successful teams listen to that feedback from the driver and act on it. Struck 1 p.m., the first qualifying session commenced, and Senna unsurprisingly quickly ascended to the top of the leaderboard. However, about 15 minutes into the session, a dramatic accident involving Rubens Barrichello unfolded at the very end of a chicane. Bar Let's have a look at this. Okay. The Jordan, by the looks of it. Barrichello's Jordan car soared through the air, ultimately colliding with the barriers. The impact was severe, but the tyres mitigated some of the force, leaving Barrichello. Now, look at that. Let's go back. Look at this car. Look at the cockpit. Look at the, effectively the safety cell for the driver. This was 30 years ago. You compare that with now. This is development. Colliding with the barriers. The impact was severe, but the tyres mitigated some of the force. There's a man in there. leaving Barrichello, though unconscious, relatively fortunate with a broken nose and bruised ribs. Senna, although not witnessing the accident, hurried to check on Barrichello's condition. After ensuring Barrichello's well-being, Senna returned to the track for the resumption of the qualifying session at 1.40pm. With a steely determination, he eclipsed his previous time, setting a remarkable lap of 1 minute and 21.548 seconds, the fastest of the entire weekend. He was on a level nobody was capable of matching. He was flying. In the wake of Barrichello's unsettling accident, Accident. Memories resurfaced of a similar. So look at this. Look at this car. This is a Lotus. The incident in 1990. Another advert. Whoopie doo. Well, I'm a, a simple seven captain with British. Involving Martin Donnelly for many. So let me just rewind that. I remember seeing this image at the time. It's resurfaced of a similar incident in 1990 involving Martin Donnelly. In fact, I remember seeing cars driving by with him on the track. Look at his leg. He's still strapped to his seat. Okay, this, look at all these bits of a car strewn on the track. That looks like his steering wheel and steering column. Relief for many. Senna had demonstrated his prowess on the track then, just as he did now. However, he acknowledged that such feats came at an emotional cost, saying, As a racing driver, there are some things you have to go through to cope with. Sometimes they're not human, yet you go through it. Some of the things are not pleasant, but in order to have some of the nice things, you have to face them. You leave a lot of things behind when you follow a passion. The next day, Senna resumed his routine, gaining confidence in the improved car. As the second qualifying session kicked off at 1pm, Damon Hill pushed the car to secure a higher position on the grid. However, everything would go wrong at 1.18 p.m. as Austrian driver Roland Ratz... Okay, Austrian driver. Bear that in mind. Ratzenberger suffered a fatal accident during the session. Senna, witnessing the accident's aftermath on the monitors, immediately knew the situation was dire. Driven by a sense of responsibility and compassion, he rushed to the accident site. The medical team battled valiantly to save Ratzenberger, but the injuries were too severe, and the young driver passed away, sending shockwaves through the paddock. Senna vis- There was very little focus on that, but apparently his wing came off as he was going down a high speed straight and it just carried on at the corner and he just smashed into the wall. And, and uh, as he's kind of, the wall's angled, so as he's then kind of come around the corner, you, you can see that he's just, he's gone. There's, there's just like, the, the size of the impact is so big that he, the guy is just, it's just a, obliterated him, unfortunately. Visibly devastated, sought some comfort in the arms of Professor Sid Watkins, grappling with the raw reality of a fellow racer's tragic fate. As the day drew to a close, Senna's thoughts were consumed by the weight of the events. It was obvious he had not been in the close proximity of death before. On that fateful Sunday morning, 
Damon Hill faced a challenging practice session, particularly when he approached the spot where Ratzenberger's tragic crash had occurred. The memories of that impact weighed heavily on him. I could imagine the force of the impact because I was actually traveling at the same speed he had been going before he went off. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have given it a second thought because even though speeds reach 200 miles per hour, it's not part of the circuit where you'd come close to the limit. It's not a place you worry about. However, in the wake of Roland's incident, Hill, like all other racers, was now grappling with the stark reality that sometimes, as a racer, you're merely a passenger, trusting your car to keep you alive at fatal speeds. Mean as a racer, you're trusting your car to keep you alive at fatal speeds. So, in order to be a racer, you're placing your life on the line. You're placing your life in the uh, hands of the machinery, the hands of the circuit design, and you've got to have a respect and a respect for everybody around you so that you do not cause somebody else's death by being basically irresponsible with what you do. This is something you learned. You watched the sport, you saw some things happen, and you learned that racing drivers had to give each other respect. Spain 2021. Spain 2021. It's the first time I was like, whoa, what's going on here? How is this driver getting away with driving like that? The strap-on fanboy gets excited by that, whereas some of us get disturbed by it. And then I hark back to this as to why I'm disturbed by it. Meanwhile, Senna once again displayed his prowess during warm-up, dominating by a staggering nine-tenths of a second. After the session, he engaged in an insightful conversation with Alain Prost, an unexpected but meaningful exchange given their historical rivalry for safety improvements, highlighting the importance of setting aside their differences for the greater good. This unanticipated interaction left Prost pleasantly surprised. I was very surprised as normally he did not even say hello if I crossed his path. As the clock struck 11am, Gerhard Berger arrived to escort Senna to the driver's briefing. Senna seized this opportunity to address a safety concern about the pace car during the formation lap, a topic he believed needed attention but refrained from raising due to personal tensions with race official John Cosmet. The briefing was somber, reflecting on the events of the previous day and honoring Ratzenberger's memory with a minute of silence. Approaching race time, a perceptible shift was noted in Senna's demeanor as he visited the Williams garage. The anticipation of the race loomed and Senna, known for his meticulous preparations, inspected the car. The buzz built as the car start neared. Precisely at 2 o'clock, the car set off on the pace lap, aligning on the grid. However, within moments, yellow flags waved, indicating a chaotic start. to stop the race I'm sure because there's debris on the circuit an unfortunate collision involving Petro Lamy's Lotus and JJ Leto's Benetton immediately marred the race starts look at all the wheels flying off cars this is again safety developments over the years look at the change of designs look at the things that have been introduced into Formula One to make the thing safer we don't want to see people die in this sport we don't want to see people die in this sport. My first letter to Sky Sports F1 in the aftermath of Abu Dhabi 2021 actually raised that point. Those that have actually looked on my Facebook page campaigning about 2021 may have read that. You right, need to scroll right back to the beginning. There's been loads of articles that I wrote on there. And that's one of the first one that I actually published on there, which was copying over onto there for public record what I wrote to Sky Sports F1. 
suddenly heightening the tension in the air. Everyone at the track that day knew this was not a good omen. The safety car made its appearance at 2.03 p.m. to manage the aftermath, ensuring the debris was swiftly cleared for a safe race. As the race resumed, Senna assumed the lead position, closely pursued by Michael Schumacher, Gerhard Berger, and Damon Hill. Despite the challenges of a fully loaded car and cold tires, Senna was flying once again. As the race unfolded, Michael Schumacher struggled to match the blistering speed of the race leader. He fell behind rapidly, causing concern for the seasoned motorsport physician, Sid Watkins. A sense of impending disaster gripped Watkins, promoting a conversation with Mario Cassoni where he bleakly predicted, there's going to be a fucking awful accident any minute. At precisely 2.17 p.m., on the seventh lap, Ayrton Senna approached the perilous Tamburello curve and his car lost control. Hurtling off the track just after the apex, crashing into the unprotected concrete wall at a staggering speed of 190 miles per hour. Despite attempting to brake, the impact reduced his speed to 130 miles per hour. So he crashed into the wall at 130 miles per hour. Why don't you just say so? leaving a trail of devastation. The collision tore off the front right wheel and nose cone, bringing the car to an abrupt halt, leaving Senna motionless within the wreckage. The ferocity of the crash had sent the front right wheel spiraling into the cockpit, striking Senna's helmet. In the immediate aftermath, Senna made a slight movement, sparking a glimmer of hope regarding his injuries. Maybe he was okay. Maybe we were all worried for no reason. Fire marshals were the first to arrive at the scene, but medical personnel soon followed, working against the clock to save the fallen racing legend. As Professor Sid Watkins rushed to the crash site in his medical car, an eerie certainty settled within him. He knew it was Senna. The extent of Senna's injuries was horrific. A team of medics fought valiantly to stabilize him, but the odds were stacked against them. Senna's car was eventually lifted away, but he was swiftly transported to Maggiore Hospital, where doctors battled to save his life. The world watched and waited, hoping for a miracle, but it seemed that even the faithful would have their resolves tested. At 2.55 p.m., 37 agonizing minutes after the crash, the race resumed. The drivers raced around the track, but there was only one thing on everyone. So, guys dying. Properly airlifted hospital now. Not none of this bullshit that Red Bull were on about for Max Verstappen at Silverstone. When we saw the guy get out and walk away from the car and wave at the crowd, right? None of that bullshit where Horner and Red Bull incite the crazies. Going, oh, we nearly killed him there when Max chopped across Lewis's nose. Right, this is real. Everyone's mind, Senna. Five minutes later, the helicopter carrying Ayrton touched down at Maggiore Hospital, where doctors rushed him into intensive care for a critical brain scan. At 3.10 p.m., his heart stopped once more, and the racing world would prepare itself for the worst. Who you got in the note? 41, another terrifying incident unfolded as a wheel flew off Michele Alboreto's Minardi car, endangering Lotus mechanics. Alboreto, realizing the gravity of the situation, rushed to understand what had transpired. The pit lane had witnessed two horrifying events, leaving everyone on edge. For Professor Sid Watkins, the hours that followed were excruciating as the race continued seemingly endless. This just wasn't important anymore, not when a driver was at death's door. Finally, at 4.20 p.m., the race ended without further incident bringing a fleeting sense of relief. The drivers on the podium, Schumacher, Larini, and Hakkinen, in that order, had no inkling of Senna's condition, yet their expressions hinted at the foreboding reality. It later so that is how humans react when they are involved in tragedy. The strap-on fanboy doesn't get that. These kids these days, they get excited by the crashes. They play a few computer games. They think they're racing gods themselves because they've played a few sim racing computer games where if you crash, it doesn't fucking matter because it's a fucking computer simulation. It's not real life. Your life isn't on the fucking line. This is real. These are the things where it should be stressed to you what is really going on and how people are endangering their life. And hence, why it should have been explained to you why certain styles of driving are not acceptable. Because there's enough shit that can go wrong in a Formula One anyway. There's enough of the danger there without 
some madman being on track, endangering people's lives. To emerge that Senna had carried a furled Austrian flag in his car, intending to honour the fallen Ratzenberger after the race. As the day so Senna was carrying an Austrian flag in his car, intending to honour Ratzenberger who had died the day before. He wore on, the medical updates grew grimmer. By the evening, the Imola Media Center was consumed by a pervasive sense of dread. The world collectively held its breath, knowing that Senna would never race again and fearing the worst. Ultimately, the news came, confirming the inevitable tragedy. Ayrton Senna passed away. His official time of death marked at 2.17 p.m., and the world seemed worse for it. A thorough investigation marked the aftermath of Ayrton Senna's tragic crash at Imola in 1994, and Italian authorities determined that a faulty modification to Senna's car's steering column made by Williams was the root cause. Williams vehemently denied responsibility, contending that the steering column broke after the impact, not before. Senna's teammate, Damon Hill, proposed a different theory. He believed Senna, while fiercely attempting to stay ahead of Michael Schumacher, had a rare error due to excessive aggression. Hill had noticed signs of nervousness and tension in Senna before the race, and recounted that Schumacher, who was tailing Senna at the time of the crash, shared similar observations. These explanations from the drivers only made Senna's death even harder to stomach. He had been devastated by the events over the weekend. No matter how skilled he was, he should not have raced. In Brazil, a wave of grief and emotion swept the nation upon Senna's passing. Oh a bit dramatic, isn't it? No matter how skilled he was, he should not have raced. Well, that's your opinion. Sadly, with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps he shouldn't have. Perhaps he shouldn't have. But again, as sports competitors, you're expected to compete. Over 3 million people are estimated to have lined the streets of Sao Paulo, paying their respects as Senna's coffin was solemnly transported from the airport to the cemetery. His funeral drew dignitaries, celebrities, fellow drivers, and a national television audience. The entire country observed three days of official mourning, with many public events postponed or cancelled. Across the globe, Senna's death ignited an outpouring of tributes and homages. Races were dedicated to his memory, and various tracks named corners or sections in his honour. At the subsequent Monaco Grand Prix, retired F1 world champion Nicky Lauda announced the revival of the Grand Prix Drivers Association, GPDA, standing as a tribute to Senna's legacy. Immediate safety changes were instituted for the Spanish and Canadian GPs, with a subsequent wave of enhancements encompassing redesigned tracks, improved crash barriers, tyre barriers, heightened safety standards, increased sills on driver cockpits, and a limit on 3-litre engines. Senna should not have died, and yet he was gone in the blink of an eye. The rest of the season would unfold with a down beat atmosphere, with Schumacher winning his first world championship. And yet, it was Imola that had changed F1 forever. But despite the obvious demons haunting Imola, it would not be the track that would become known as a racing hell. Oh no, that claim well and truly belongs to another famous circuit. Right, so that is that video. So 30 years on, We've got Sebastian Vettel, retired from the sport, never said anything about 2021 Abu Dhabi corruption, decided that he wants to uh, paint the curbs at um, Suzuka black and yellow for the bees to save the planet at a place where they're burning fossil fuels, which is supposed to be causing climate change. That's fucking the planet up. Now we're uh, forever Senna, okay? Educating the kids about what? Um, we're getting likes, so aren't we? We're getting likes on social media with this. What's going on here? Seb, are you going to post about the genocide against Palestine? Oh, yeah, they're not allowed to do that, are they? They're not allowed to do that. You see, within Formula One, they ban them from making political statements. They ban them from uh, making any awareness, make, raising any issue. 
that any of the sponsors might think, oh, they're controversial. That's going to divide opinion. So when Lewis Hamilton campaigns for Black Lives Matters, oh, that's going to divide opinion. That's going to be controversial. Our sponsors don't want to be associated with controversy. You're not allowed to say anything about that. When Lewis Hamilton stands up to try for try to promote equality, raise awareness about the notion of certain people feel that they're being persecuted in life for their sexuality, for their ethnicity, for their gender, for their skin colour. Oh, no, that might create conflict. You're now, now no longer allowed to say anything. You're not allowed to make political statements, apparently. Why is that? Oh, because some of our sponsors don't want to be associated with the conflict. We just want to sell our shit to an audience where everybody's happy. But Seb, Seb's allowed to, um, to, to make his little campaigns, isn't he? Seb's allowed to make his uh, political statements that aren't upsetting anybody, not really dealing with the true issues. OK, you know, he's, 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 he's made his, let me see if I can um, just move this on. So there he is. So we've got this one here and we've got um, what's the Austrian flag for in the comments section. See the comments section, what a wonderful place that is, right? The comments section, you could you could go and educate yourself or you could just like, ask it in the comment section but that's, that's that's the trouble with the comment section people don't go away and educate themselves we've got most of the grid there has joined sebastian vettel on this run around imola he's had these little locks created where drivers can get one of these brazilian flag colored locks and lock it to the the chain link fence at the, the end and lock in their their thoughts or whatever lovely right um most of the drivers there are wearing these yellow t-shirts with forever center on them there's uh, one here oh um he's not bothered does he he's not bothered he, he, he's turned up for the photo but he's actually um yeah he, he can't be bothered to wear a t-shirt can he the guy on the end is um is well known for being a center fan he said it for the last 15, 20 years that he is a Senna fan. In fact, he his helmet was inspired by Senna before he even got into Formula 1. But, you know, you strap on fanboys, you don't realise. You don't realise the history, OK? You don't realise the significance. Um, but now, because the time is right to virtue signal, Seb has uh, taken it on himself to raise this campaign What's the truth behind the campaign, though, Seb? What's the truth? What's the true nature of the of the campaign? Because we can wear a yellow T-shirt and we can wear a T-shirt saying Forever Senna and we can wear a red and white wristband for Roland Ratzenberger. But what's the true message? Well, the true message is safety in sport. A man died. He was a great at the sport. Ratzenberger, whilst not being a great of the sport, he hadn't established himself. We don't know how good he could have been, OK? But a man died. Two men died in two days. What have we learned? Well... What we should be learning and what we should be focusing on and what we should be educating people about is safety within the sport of motor racing. It's a dangerous sport. When you're traveling at 200 miles an hour, your body, the human body, is not designed to cope with impacts of that nature. Therefore, the machinery and the environment has to be able to cope with dissipating that energy. Because the human body cannot, it will not sustain that. 
So it's a sports responsibility and those competing within it to focus on the notion of safety to protect lives. And that is a multitude of things. That is the designs of the cars, making them as safe as possible for the occupant. The designs of tracks, making them as safe as possible for the men, the racers on track. The design of the crash barriers and the runoff areas, making it as safe as possible. The decision making of the human beings, that being race control, marshalling, okay? And the driver responsibility. The responsibility of drivers to their fellow driver. What have you said about that, Seb? What have you said about that? So you can wear your fucking T-shirt. You can wear your fucking wristband. You can make these poxy little locks. You can virtue signal all you like. But what's the fucking real crux of this? What's going to save people's lives? What is going to save drivers' lives? Because what we saw in 2021 was a style of driving permitted, which was fucking disgusting. You saw Max Verstappen force Lewis Hamilton to have to deviate his line in the braking zone. That is not acceptable. That was Spain. You saw him run him off track at Imola 2021. You saw him run him off track at Monza. 2021 and then you saw him at a later incident end up on Sir Lewis Hamilton's head and were it not for that halo Hamilton could have been severely injured if not dead in that incident you then saw Ham uh, Verstappen chop across Hamilton causing an accident at Silverstone you saw what he did at Brazil running him off the track you see him break test Hamilton at Saudi. You see him run Lewis Hamilton off the track again at Saudi. You see the late lunge at Abu Dhabi. All of these are completely unacceptable driving. What did you say, Seb? What did you say? What did anybody say? What did the FIA say? What did... Any of the drivers say? Any of the teams say? Oh, we call that let them race. That's what fucking Wheatley and Horner would tell you. Oh, we call that let them race. This arouses the strap-on fanboy. We like that. Sky Sports go, oh, Max has got his elbows out. Max has got this uncompromising style of driving. Max has come along this with this season with a more aggressive style of driving for everybody to have to contend with. No, it's fucking unacceptable. It's dangerous and it's shit like that that costs people their lives. Fortunately, nobody died. Nobody suffered serious injury in that season. But the problem is this. I watched 1994 as a child. There will be children who watch 2021. They will grow up. Some of them children might be involved in motorsport. They will see that kind of driving. They will try and replicate it. The vehicles that they will be driving may not be as advanced as Formula One cars. The racing circuits that they are driving at may not be as good or have the same requirements of a Formula One circuit. The crashes that they will be involved in, in fact, the drivers that they will be up against trying to perform those strap-on fucking manoeuvres won't be as talented as Sir Lewis Hamilton with the ability to get out of the way of it. There will be crashes there is a much increased chance of injury or death. That is the example that this sport has given to the world, to up-and-coming, up and aspiring racers. Oh, this is acceptable to drive like this. We learnt back in 1994, 30 fucking years ago, 
reasons why we need to be as safe as possible in motor racing. And whilst we can focus on track design, whilst we can focus on car design and all of these things, driver responsibility is a huge part of that. Driver responsibility is a huge part of that. And what did this sport do in 2021? It enabled it enabled Max Verstappen to drive in a manner that is totally unacceptable. And that influenced the fucking kids. Sky Sports F1 validate it, you filthy bastards. And nobody called it out. But now this fucking virtue signalling prick is going, oh, 30 years forever Senna. What's the true message to give about this? What's the true message to give about this? Because it's not about getting... 1.6 million likes on fucking Instagram. 1.6 million likes on Instagram. Whoopie fucking do. It's people's lives. It's people's lives. Oh, but the kids who follow you on Instagram, Seb, the kids will love that. Oh, the kids will say forever send that. They know fuck all about it. If you want to learn anything from Senna's death, you need to learn that you need to be responsible. You need to be responsible. You need to be mindful of the dangers. And you need to conduct yourself accordingly. And you need to have compassion for your fellow man. Because that's not what you're getting. That's not the message that you're getting from Formula One at the moment. They don't give a fuck. They just want to hype you up and sell you the show. They care about your money. They care about getting you excited. They care about hyping you up. They don't give a fuck about real values. Filthy bastards. But they're billionaires. They're billionaires. And that's all good. As long as you're excited and you're paying your money and they're billionaires and they're making more money, you can virtue signal all you fucking like. So, Seb, yeah. I used to have some sort of respect for you. I used to have respect for you. But if this is all you can fucking do, if this is all you can fucking do, a man who I thought had some principles, what the fuck did you say about 2021? When you went up and consoled Sir Lewis Hamilton after he'd been robbed, what have you subsequently said about that, Seb? What have you subsequently said about that? What have you subsequently revealed about even your radio message, Seb? Are you like, ah, oh, yeah, well, we do need to be in lapping now. Otherwise, this isn't going to happen, is it? You knew the rules, Seb. What had gone on beforehand, Seb? Because you've never spoken about that, have you? Are teams allowed to decide before a race that we're going to have a racing finish? Oh, what doesn't matter what, what the rules are. At all costs, we're going to make sure we have a racing... Fi well, that's illegal, Seb. Have you ever spoken about that? No, no, no. But you wear a nice yellow T-shirt and a red and white uh, uh, wristband for your... Um, oh, it's even more now. It's uh, 1,847,595 likes. It's all about the likes, isn't it? It's all about the likes.